Um, thank you, Catherine. And everyone at the Poetry as Commemoration Project, which is so special, um, and really hearing your poems was incredibly moving. Um, you're also talented and incredibly um, astute, and they were really, really beautiful poems. So thank you so much for sharing them. It was a real honour to be here. Um, so I will talk a little bit more about the background to this poem um, with Lucy. You have a copy of it, I think, with you. If you would like to follow along, um, you'll see why in a minute. It's um, an interesting poem, and it was certainly an in interesting poem to write. Um, so bear with me as I, as I read it, and I look forward to discussing a little bit more about it with you. Special Topics in Commemoration Studies, the Kerry Archives. Not coffins, but boxes, neat and small enough to be lined up in chronological order on the desk upstairs in Kerry Library. The paper inside each one, burnt with age, emits a bitter smell that turns sweet when exposed to air. Pages as fragile as skin, as thin, words and letters typed, scrawled, printed, shaped by a very careful child's hand pile up. So many leaflets, postcards and copy books, labelled exercise books, where students practice remembering for those who do not wish to. Blood turned blue and black instead along horizontal lines moving forward. Divided into sections, these accounts are numbered with mistakes crossed out but still visible as the eye moves over each page. Names and dates rearranged, a repository of pain. Section 1A, collected by, as told by, and, and other members of the family. Song given to, by her mother. C, gave the following song to her daughter. D, the following account of incidents was given to, of, by. E, as recorded by, in conversation with. F gave the following information to. G got the following information from. H told by to. I told to by. J collected by as told by and other members of the family. Section two, we were often out at night, blocking roads, knocking bridges. Section three, sad is the story in Kerry today, they beat them up and cut off their hair. To this day, he is stone deaf in both ears, Ishka Fuitalov, they used the pump to wash off the blood. No means whatsoever. A complete wreck, unfit for any work. Hopelessly insane. Neurasthenic. No middle path. We are near starving. Section four. What in God's holy name am I to do? What in God's name am I supposed to do? Section five, one pile for receipts, one for pension books, another for begging letters. Do I fit the eligibility criteria? One relative gets a pension, the other doesn't. I am an encumbrance to myself and everyone. Even in death, hounded and tortured by bureaucracy, it is the money that kills, the paper, the lack of paper, the papers. Section six, 
I can't think of any more because I am getting old. Section seven. I have been given advice. The but is unavoidable, but I must avoid it. I avoid it. Section eight. I become increasingly alert. There are monuments everywhere. I drive past them too quickly. Section nine. I cannot get the phrase war of friends out of my head. Section 10. Group work for secondary school history students to promote cooperative learning while studying the War of Independence, the Irish Civil War. One, imagine you were there, what would you do? Two, write a letter to one of the participants, witnesses, soldiers, civilians, outlining your thoughts on events. What advice would you give them? Three, what side of the conflict would you be on? Give reasons for your answer. Four, quantify and discuss individual, family, generational, ancestral trauma in your own life. Five, compare and contrast this trauma to others you know. Six, make a timeline. Seven, construct a poster. Eight, draw a diagram. Nine, write a poem. Ten, haven't we all suffered enough? When I pick, pack up the boxes, one elderly page slashes my finger. I am terrified it will bleed over everything. So work quickly to reseal what cannot be contained. I had been so careful to memorize the placement of each piece. I have certainly gotten it wrong, but healing allows for a wound. Thank you. So um, as Catherine explained, um, 10 poems were commissioned, um, 10 poets with complete freedom to engage with an archive or a, you know, any, any object of their choosing. So um, could you tell us a bit about your, your first feelings or your response when you receive that invitation? I'll take that too. Thank you so much. Um, I love this line of work that I'm in, the world of poetry, because you never know, I was just saying it to Catherine earlier, you never know what's going to arrive in your email at any given moment. And the most extraordinary and interesting and challenging um, com commissions arrive, such as, as the poetry is commemoration. So my first instinct or my first feeling when I saw the email was, oh my gosh, this is so thrilling. And I was so excited. and. The way it was laid out was so beautifully sensitive and so intriguing and so necessary. And being a poet, being fervently of the position that poetry is essential um, to all we do in a really good way of understanding difficult events and difficult feelings, um, I was really excited. And then I decided on what archive I would um, visit. And initially I was kind of thinking very big and you know, going to Dublin, and I live in Kerry. Um, and then I thought, well, I have an archive down the road in Trilly Library, and I go there every week with my little girl to pick out books, and I thought, I'll go and see what they have. And that was a really powerful moment, I think, as somebody who is a blow-in to Kerry, I'm from Fork originally, as Catherine mentioned, um, to really engage with the history of the place um, in a very intimate way, it felt very intimate and it felt almost like I was like really nosing around um, in these archives. And I was very lucky because the, the county archivist, Mike Lynch, was there and he was close to retirement and he had some time to spend with me and look over the archives and advised me, shall we say, um, which we might come to in a minute, but it was then I realised, I think, the responsibility, and maybe some of you who wrote your poems had that feeling too, the responsibility of doing justice to our collective past and what happened, um, whatever side of the, um, whatever side our families may have been on or historically, um, often families were on both sides rather tragically as we've heard. 
So it was it was a bit scary and a little bit anxiety inducing, certainly. I'm really interested in what you were saying about the archivist um, and that idea of, you know, getting that guidance or that support, because um, it's always struck me as somebody who works in archives, not so much creatively, but for other research purposes, that often a project can turn on that apparently random conversation you have um, with an archivist. And one of the interesting things, obviously, was your choice to go to a local archive um, and perhaps an archive that has been maybe less explored than the more prominent ones. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about what material the archivist showed you or how that kind of how those conversations or that kind of guidance worked and how you settled on the, the group of materials that then proved your inspiration. Um, I, I knew the county archivist um, personally through Listowel Writers Week, of which he was a, a member for many years. So I'd never met him in this professional setting before. And um, he's a very, very brilliant, very opinionated gentleman, which I really appreciate. And when he heard what I was doing, he was very thrilled that I had chosen, obviously, the, the Kerry Archives, but a little bit worried too about what this Cork woman would do with the precious Kerry, <laughs> Kerry gold. Um, and he brought out, I think it was maybe four shoe boxes, maybe slightly bigger than shoe boxes. And he asked me what I was kind of considering writing about. And I said, as one does when one is from Cork and blithely unaware really of the very deep feelings about this period in Kerry, which I shouldn't have been. And that this is what a very valuable thing I learned doing this. I said, oh, the Bally City Massacre. And his face just fell with shock. <laughs> and I said, oh, no. And he said, you can't, you can't do that. You can't. And I was like, but I would be really sensitive and it would be really, and he was like, no, 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 no. You cannot write about that. And that for me was a really huge turning point because this man, as all archivists are, are so keenly aware of the, the fact that history is present and happening all the time, right now, always. And so I really felt um, chastened, <laughs> which is always a good feeling and a good place to start with any project. But equally, I was fascinated to know why, like what, exactly why. So he told me a lot about various monuments, the different sides of the conflict um, were building, and they were different monuments, and they were defacing each other's mind. And this is in the present moment. And I thought, oh, so this is like a very open wound and this kind of, that kind of gave me a perspective on how I was going to view the archives really. And they became almost too hot to handle in a way. I had a very different feeling around them. And so my instinct was that it was about what we can't say and, and what everybody was speaking about earlier was so powerful and spoke to that, that when you speak about something or mention something or look at an archive again or really examine, you know, people spoke about um, their own their own um, personal history. It's incredibly freeing and incredibly liberating. But equally, I, I was under duty to respect, obviously, the very delicate situation that exists still um, and these wounds that are still um, hurting and that that's OK as well that they don't need to be healed. It's going to take an awfully long time for us all um, as, a, as a culture and as a society. And I think this project is a huge act of healing, actually. Um, so that changed very much my approach, looking at those four boxes um, and wondering what to do next. <laughs> Yeah, I think that that question, obviously, what can't be said or, you know, the challenges to speech, we maybe come to how that plays out in the text of the poem in a, in a moment. I was really struck when Anna was reading of of the sense of perhaps the difference between dealing with a story or a material that is a part of a collective narrative and approaching it from a very personal perspective. And that brings obviously there is that dimension of, of healing that can emerge from it, but it's also extremely challenging and traumatic. 
process. And so there's those very diff different things yes. in play, I, yes. I think, depending on whether you're talking about a, a family or a very personal um, set of material. Um, and I wondered um, if you felt, um, if you were very conscious of that yourself in terms of, uh, obviously we'll, we'll come a little later to the impact of this on your poetry in a larger way, but I mean often in your poetry you're writing about quite personal experiences and from a very personal perspective. So I wonder, did you enter the archive thinking about the potential for a sort of personal discovery or engagement, or were, you, were your eyes fixed more on the political that sense. That's such an excellent question. It was almost like you were in my brain there for a minute as I sat there. Um, I would be, I think, naturally as a poet interested in exploring the self and, you know, using writing as a means to um, discover more about the self and learn about the self. So it's, it's a very, very, you know, I use the lyric I all the time and that's my comfort zone, I suppose. Um, even though it's violently uncomfortable. Um, but with this, I really felt that I, I didn't want my voice to be there because I feel like I didn't know how to, because um, I felt as well, because it wasn't the Cork archives, <laughs> which maybe I would feel a little bit more ownership over. But I was very conscious of the fact that I didn't want to get in the way of these documents and of the, these collective voices that were, you know, overwhelmingly presenting themselves to me um, as I went through the archive. Um, and so I really felt I needed to take a different approach with the material and, and move away from that I perspective into that more collective um, mindset. And equally, as a recovering history teacher, um, I was a history, uh, a history and English secondary school teacher. I was also aware of um, how I approached history as a subject in secondary school and how sometimes um, it can become in a, in a you know, very well-meaning effort to encourage students to be you know, involved and engaged. I could, or we maybe as a group of secondary school teachers could in fact maybe deaden or not deaden is the wrong word but maybe simplify because you're trying to simplify an incredibly complex weighty difficult subject so that people can understand it and remember it and maybe you know become interested in it and so I had my teacher hat on and I was like what are you doing here why are you and and that somehow became part of um how history books take all these archival materials and kind of sanitize them, I suppose, and how that can involve a lot of loss um, in terms of the, the pain and the intensity of what people, you know, felt at the time and still feel. But yet it's very hard to balance that kind of situation. So the poem is kind of grappling with this is what actually happened. I can't talk about what actually happened. Let's do this exercise <laughs> and try and figure out um, in some way. So it was um, it was quite an overwhelming experience intellectually um, and, and emotionally I found it quite difficult because um, I found it an incredibly noisy thing to do. Like my head was full of all of these different documents and different voices and I think that's what the poem then became. I was trying to organise them. I'm not very as you can probably tell. <laughs> so I was like trying, and then I was like, why am I trying to organize them? Why is that my intention? That's not necessarily what I need to do here. And then feeling quite um, inadequate in terms of what else can you do if you're not organizing the information? So it was trying to give everything, everyone, all of the different materials a moment, but equally acknowledge the fact that they are very emotional, weighty, uh, funny sometimes, um, very moving pieces in and of themselves. Yeah, I'm interested in, in you using that word organising, you know, and uh, obviously some people going into the archive, whether the commissioned poems or, or others who've been in workshops, have focused on, say, a single, a single object or a single letter or a single character. Um, whereas much of what's going on in your text is about the interaction between all those materials and how you arrange them or what they mean in relation to one another. And I think that's 
go on a sidetrack for a minute, I think that's one of the really interesting things about listening to the poems today um, and seeing the poems on our website as well is all the different facets um, and the way in which you can think in new ways about history because you're seeing those things next yes. to one another, you know, and interwoven, if you like, with one another. So um, I want to talk a bit more about the poem. I mean, um, obviously, we, in a sense, needed to have it on the page in front of us because while you read very beautifully and expressively, you actually have to see the kind of typographical layout to understand it fully, I think, um, or to begin understanding it. And it's interesting the way it sort of begins and ends with the more personal narrative, the engagement of the archive, and then it has these sections in between. So could you say a little bit more about when, at what point in the process you arrived at that idea, that formal sort of structure, that arrangement, if you like, or organisation? Um, or did the poem go through some different manifestations, different versions uh, before that? I really like the word arrangement. Yeah. I really like that. Thank you. Um, so I made loads of notes, loads and pages and pages and pages of notes. And I took a lot of pictures because Mike Lynch let me and uh, he was very kind. And I went for a residency um, in the Tyrone Guthrie Centre um, in County Monaghan, which is a beautiful writer's retreat or artist's retreat. And um, I sat at a desk overlooking the lake with all of these pages spread out. They're on the desk, they're on the floor, they're on my phone, they're on my computer. And I was looking, if I'm entirely honest, for that one piece. I was looking for that, this will be my poem document. And I kept on trying, you know, I'd pick one and I'd get so far and it was like, no, that's not it. And I'd try another one and I'd get so far. And I was getting really frustrated and worried. And there was a few, I don't know if we should tell Catherine this. There's <laughs> There was a WhatsApp flurry between some of the commissioned poets <laughs> going, how are you getting on? Oh my God, this is terrifying. Um, and then I thought, well, this is poetry as commemoration. And I'm going to be honest here about the fact that I cannot find that particular voice because they're all shouting at me. They all want space. They all want to be heard. And they were just such different stories. They were, they were children's notebooks, exercise books that I mentioned that were right, they were writing down the memories of their older relatives. And then the kids obviously would just keep writing what the adults said. So that line, um, I'm getting tired now because I'm older. I, I, can't, I can't even remember my own line. That's a direct line from one of the copies where clearly the kid was just like writing what the grandfather was saying. <laughs> so I was just intrigued by that, those voices. And then obviously the really, the letters that were so beautifully um, read earlier, um, the letters looking for pensions, the letters of people who were um, really disturbed, profoundly injured and traumatized by what they experienced and having no support and no one to listen to them and their families being desperate, trying to figure out how can we help them? Where can they go? How can we support them? And there was nothing, nothing. And that kind of story, how that has been played out in our history over and over again in different ways. And so to be honest, um, I was quite overwhelmed and I was quite overstimulated by just, the, and this was a small archive, so I was very glad <laughs> just maybe picked that smaller one um, and then I thought about really um, how and, and one of the, the wonderful um, students from Skull Poland, Kilfinan, mentioned it there about um, how we are lit, like all of our documents and all of our bills and all of the notes we make, they're all our personal archive you know, all of the little you know, letters we write or, you know, maybe now we'll have a digital archive, all of the TikToks you make, rather horrifying, <laughs> will probably be part of your uh, your digital archive. Um, and so then it became a little bit more personal when I was like, this is just people and their things and what we've managed to keep. And I'm going to give them as much as I can a space, but bearing in mind that it's safer for them and for me in this moment and for the situation to leave some things out for now, because it's not quite healed yet. 
Yeah, I think your WhatsApp messages should be part of your account. <laughs> Can't we get onto that now? <laughs> Full disclosure, <laughs> full disclosure, that's required. Um, one of the interesting things about the poem, I think, is the way in which it does play with that interaction between the personal and the bureaucratic, and it particularly comes out with the pensions information, you know, that's obviously shaped um, a number of poems that have emerged um, as part of this project. So I wondered, um, and of course, the archive itself could be seen as a sort of bureaucratic process of, of naming and arranging and filing and retaining and so on. Um, and I wondered if you saw, like when you were talking about these voices clamoring for attention, if you like, um, did you see always a, a clash between the idea of the, pers the personal will or desire or need and then the bureaucratic structure, and that particularly that you know continued on in generations after the um, the revolution. Was that something that you were particularly interested in? Yeah, it was. It was extraordinary looking at the um, cognitive dissonance in a sense because there were um, people had caught out. These were the Con Casey archives, so he was very um, prominent in the IRA and Kerry and Munster. And he eventually became the editor of The Kerry Man. So he had quite a wide range of interests. And I'd say people gave him a lot of things as well. And he kept everything. Um, so they were, you know, pictures of harps from, you know, Ireland's own or all of these magazines cut out. And there were a lot of ballads and a lot of um, poems that were written in praise of all of the, the fallen heroes. And then there would be this dreadful account of someone's experience of having their hair pulled out of their head and they were all like together um and I found that really difficult to again arrange because I was like so they're all you know very much on one side or the other although there were people who were clearly you know going what is going on also um which I think there are more of those people than we realize when you actually go and look at the archives but it was a very um, confusing place. And I think the certainty that some people had around being right politically allowed, in the way that certainty does, to banish those voices of doubt and banish those kind of personal worries because it was the cause. And if we just focus on the cause, that is at least a very clean knife with which to cut through your life if you have a very, very distinct um, point of view. And, and so it was actually, I think, the people who, who had a little bit more nuance in their thinking, um, for whatever reason, were, were suffering psychically an awful lot because they were kind of... So they were, you know, these, these very um, great ballads and then these really appalling um, accounts together. So I did find that... Um, fascinating and really um, educational, but also really sad. Like it was sad, very sad. Yes, very much. Um, I'm interested in the both the beginning and the end of the poem have very strong imagery, particularly bodily imagery, the imagery of the skin, the imagery of the blood that the poem um, ends with. Um, and that seemed to me to move closer to some of the imagery from, you know, your, your other collection and so on. So I was wondering, could you talk a bit about how the, the, the opening and closing parts, if you like, relate to the, the sections in the middle that are drawn, obviously, more directly from the archival material? And maybe talk a bit more about that imagery of the body in particular. I think it felt when I was there sitting at the table upstairs in Trilly Library, which is a lovely space, very nice. I had it all to myself as well, it was delightful. Um, it very much felt like when I saw those boxes lined up, it really did look like tiny coffins. And I did have this feeling of, um, you know, you, you get a little bit of a whisper of your own mortality in those moments because you're like, oh, I have shoe boxes at home that have tickets and, you know, this is where we all end up in the end, is just little, you know, collections of, of um, material and things that we leave behind and that meant something to us. And so I think I wanted to bear witness to it in some way. I wanted to, you know, make it clear in the poem that this was something I was doing and that I was very aware that it was 
I was alive. <laughs> I wanted to really emphasize that contrast between the privilege and the smugness in a weird way of like being alive in that moment and interacting with these materials that I have, like I tried to, to you know, figure out based on the notes and based on looking through it, the context of these these materials, but I didn't really know because they're lost with the people who, who own them. So I did feel that maybe it would allow myself access to um, the material a little bit more if I did embody someone alive at the beginning of the poem and equally at the end because we're the people that are commemorating this event and we're the people who just so happen to be alive right now. We're the people who, if you caught us, we will bleed. And we're the people who have, I suppose, the opportunity as this project does so beautifully to acknowledge the wound. And that like the first step in healing is like looking at the hurt first. And so I think I wanted to really make that very clear visually at the beginning and at the end that this still hurts. There is a wound, but you can't heal unless there's a wound. So in a sense that it is part of the process of, of um, coming to terms with our history, coming to terms with the mistakes that we made, our ancestors made, um, the, the terrible events that happened to them, you know, their bravery, their um, misguidedness, the fact that they weren't perfect, which I think sometimes I grapple with when I find out something new about a family member or about something, you know, like, gosh, they were just human bumbling along just like we are. Um, and sometimes I think we can, I can maybe, even when I'm teaching history, imbue them with some sort of like magic power or you know that they were somehow flawless but of course you know we're just we're just the humans now on this part of the timeline and they were just the humans then just going through a very very challenging time so um i think i just wanted to bring it back to the body that we're all in at the moment and just um acknowledge that present moment too yeah, I think that's really interesting, that sense of in the presence of, of the deathly or the commemorative, the, you know, the need to be alive or to register your own aliveness is really interesting. We might just round up the conversation then by thinking a bit about the relationship between this, um, I suppose, this whole activity, this whole um, creative process and your other work. Um, did you find when you when you went to these materials and when you were in Anna McCarrick, you know, grappling with all, the, all that paper, um, <laughs> did you find there were certain echoes with your past work or with things that you'd previously been interested in? Um, and that that sort of, you know, pro those things kind of rose up out of the material to you. Um, and similarly, do you feel that that experience is, is impacting your, your current work in any way? Absolutely. Um, I think I've always been, as I say, interested in history and, and teaching history was it's a wonderful subject to teach. And there's so many amazing students who are so knowledgeable about it. Um, so I, I've written a few poems about um, moments in Irish history already. So it felt like maybe a little bit of a continuation of that in terms of theme and content, perhaps. But equally, um, I was working on my second collection, which is coming out in February. And it's a difficult, the difficult second collection. Um, it's a, around very difficult topics. And I was feeling very, very um, scared about how I would explore them because I feel they are necessary to explore, but in a way that was um, useful and positive. And I think the process of going through these archives, examining my own biases, my own desire to impose my own narrative on them, my desire to write about the Bally CD massacre because it was dramatic and, you know, I was like, oh, I'm going to heal the rifts by writing this poem. You know, it really <laughs> brought me down quite a number of pegs, which was very good. Um, so I think that awareness that I gleaned from this project is definitely something that I've brought into my new poems and that I will bring on um, in the future. And it's, I think, really exciting too, um, to think about the possibilities, the creative possibilities of archives, no matter what kind of artist you are. And um, Evelyn, 
over here, um, showed me the archives here um, recently and just an extraordinary, the special collections, extraordinary wealth of material. And so I'm hoping to do um, workshops in my role as writer in residence in the winter based around those archives. And I was thinking, you know, I think something something might come up for me as well around that. So um, it's been a really extraordinary project and um, I've been really, really honoured to be part of it. And, and especially being here today, it's been really lovely. Would you like to read a few poems? To I will read them? two very short poems. Um, and thank you for your patience and for being such a gorgeous audience. Um, I'm going to read... Um, first poem I'm going to read um, is one of my favourites to read and um, I went to an all girls school not like Skull Pole and unfortunately the boys school was um, in the next town over with the other girls school so we were bereft of boys and both of those schools called us the um, Virgin Megastore which was, yeah, it was so true. We didn't care though, we really cared. And um, I was obsessed with history and English. They were my favorite subjects. And I fell completely in love with um, the men in my history books for want of any actual flesh and blood people around. I was too scared to talk to the boys on the bus. And Particularly, Michael Collins was one of my favourites. Um, I mean, Michael Collins, West Cork man, can't beat them. And WB Yeats, problematic fave, and also impossibly Roger Casement, um, who would not have been interested, but was <laughs> such a magnificent specimen, if he doesn't mind me saying so. So um, when I think, when I was thinking about history and its impact on me growing up, and it was almost like a companion or, or some sort of um, strange, you know, maybe even comfort, um, I wrote this poem. Cork Schoolgirl Considers the GPO Dublin 2016. I'm standing outside the GPO in my school uniform, which isn't ideal. My uniform is the colour of bull's blood. In this year, I am 16. A pleasing symmetry because I love history. Have I told you that? It is mine, so I carry it in my rucksack. I love all the men of history sacrificing themselves for Ireland, for me, these rebel Jesuses. I put my finger in the building's bullet holes, poke around in its wounds. I wonder if they feel it, those boys. I hope they do. Their blooming faces pressed flat in the pages of my books. I lick the wall as if it were a stamp. It tastes of bones, this smelly city, of those boys in uniforms. There's bloody too. I put my lips to the pillar. I want to kiss them all. And I do. I kiss all those boys goodbye. Oh, thank you. The other poem I'm going to um, read, which is now suddenly going to come on my rotation of poems to read, is my leaving cert on a scene poem. I know. Um, <laughs> I was briefly infamous among 18 year olds on Friday um, who all suddenly um, Instagram DM'd me in huge numbers asking me for the answer. <laughs> um, and also there was one, one message that just said, boss poem. <laughs> And I was like, I have arrived. I have a boss poem. Um, so I read this to all of the students um, from Skull Pole in Kilfinnan. And what an amazing, talented group you are. And keep going with your amazing creative writing club. And um, you should be so proud of yourselves. And it's wonderful that uh, Poetry's commemoration is reaching out to schools. It's a very, very special thing. So this is for you guys. Guest room. I changed the duvet cover like she showed me. 
inside out, corner to corner. Lifted over my head, seams must be flush. I fold a pyramid of towels jeweled with tiny soaps, body lotions borrowed from hotels, the red hot water bottle I'll fill later, her rubber husband. I shake and vac the carpet forest fresh, suck spiders webs from each corner, gray and fuzzy, thick as pelts. My mother's perfume sniffs out that I did not iron the sheets. Her nightdress pressed into a perfect square, a village of potions on the bedside locker. My heart sags, an empty hammock yawning for the cradle of her arms the animal comfort of her wolf fur coat. I hear her pottering in the kitchen, tidying. I turn out the light. Night cracks its knuckles. Thank you so much.